Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Discovery Channel after a brief hiatus for two weeks of uh, food, music, mu music and food uh, on my part, that is, at least at the uh, at the uh, Jazz and Heritage Festival here in New Orleans with the uh, 500,000 of my closest friends who came by to eat my crawfish and ask if I had a bathroom and um, <laughs> could I park in front of your house? Um, I had relatives that I don't even know I had show up out of the woodwork so. <laughs> um so anyways we're back uh and we are uh i'm joined again by doug austin of course doug from uh, e-discovery today um uh, and lots of other stuff uh still claiming the houston astros as a reference though doug um yeah i mean i got I have to claim them uh, good or bad so yeah I there mean, you I go no they're not very good right now but uh the sign of a true fan that's that's <laughs> what i like to hear not a, not a fair weather fan. You didn't just jump on the bandwagon when they're cheating their way to a World Series title. Oh, yes. There we go. There we go. <laughs> I, I, knew, I knew you'd throw that in there. Yes. Had to do it. When we're Had winning, to do we're it. Cheating, when we're losing, you know, we're I, I mean, know Pete all. Rose can't get in the Hall of Fame, but the Astros don't get eh, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Anyways, and we're really, really happy to be joined uh, today by Martin Tully, uh, uh, member partner, Martin. Yes, sir. Shareholder partner at Regrave, the well-known uh, firm uh, in the United States. And if you, as we said before we started, if you don't know who Martin is, well, then uh, we're going to change your name to Rip Van Winkle because you've clearly not been paying attention for the last ten years. Martin's got an extensive background. Um, not even background. I can't call it background. You get extensive experience as a, a litigator, a writer, an author. A, a, you know. You're on the standard, web. You're standards in... creator. Yeah. Sketch yeah. comedy actor. <laughs> yeah. He's here all stunt, week. Two shows double in my spare time. <laughs> there you go. Martin, w welcome very much. So um, thank you for uh, having me. You betcha. So obviously you're with Red Grave. Uh, yes. I know you went to uh, you went to undergraduate in law school, both, I believe, in Chicago. Uh, so let's start with some of your background. Are you a Chicago native? Did you grow up in Chicago? I am a uh, born and raised uh, native of the Chicago suburbs. So I've uh, lived in Chicago. I've lived in the suburbs of Chicago. I went to school in Chicago and I practiced all my career in Chicago. So you, you right. could say that I'm Chicago through and through. Well, and, and, and which baseball team do you root for? Well, so that's a very sensitive topic here in Chicago. <laughs> and and I, I'm going to make somebody mad by my answer, which is also going to be viewed as indecisive, but it's not. And I'll explain why. Uh, so I root for both the Cubs and the White Sox, Ooh. which most people say, oh, wait a minute, you have to pick a side. You can't you can't be a fan of both, to which I respond. Now, hold on a minute. It's not as though we have so many championships in Chicago baseball that <laughs> You shouldn't be excited when either team uh, gets to that level. Um, but uh, the reality is uh, my my dad and all his brothers were Sox fans. Uh, somehow he managed to raise four Cubs fans, including myself. Some of my earliest experiences were at Wrigley Field. Uh, my kids uh, started out as Sox fans and then switched to Cubs fans. But the, the reality is uh, I enjoyed both the, the White Sox 2005 World Series against the Astros back then yeah. uh as well as the the cubs more recent world series which was long awaited um but yeah. because i i do get pressured by true chicagoans to say look okay i heard all that very fancy lawyer talk but at the end of the day who do you support Pick and my one. answer is if they were playing each other in the world series i would root for the go. cubs all right uh, if, uh funny i i i i i don't even recall what i was doing there but i was in chicago the the night that the White Sox won the World Series, um, and I happened to be in the Billy Goat Tavern enjoying a, their fine cuisine, and the place was packed with cops who were st staging. Then, well, they had to stage somewhere, so right. it might as well be a bar, right? Um, and uh, for the event, if there was a, a, a celebration, they were all going to run upstairs and take their positions. And uh, I've never seen so many cops move so fast since the last time. <laughs> The SWAT team invaded my South Boston neighborhood. They were out of there in a second and a half uh, at, the, at the last inning. It was pretty funny. Pretty funny. So high school in Chicago and then um, and then I'm going to have to cheat. That's uh, all right. University, University of Illinois at Chicago. Okay. Okay. And then DePaul University College of Law in Chicago. DePaul. There you go. So 
how did that lead to um, <laughs> the fine mess you find us in now, Ollie? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, why law school and then, and then why e-discovery? Sure. It's a long story, so bear with me. Uh, I'll try to make it palatable. Uh, growing up, I wanted to be uh, an uh, airline pilot. My plan was to join the uh, United States Air Force, do my tour of duty, and then when I was done, come out and be, as many pilots do, come out and be a commercial airline pilot working for one of the fine airlines in our country. Uh, but as you'll notice, I'm wearing these things on my face called spectacles, which at the time uh, indicated that I did not have 20-20 vision. So uh, while that has since changed, more or less that was going to be a problem to be a jet fighter pilot. Uh, back in the day so distraught as i was i, and I'm I went sorry to high to school what year was that what, what, what what's the time frame here oh i'm gonna date myself but uh this would have been um the late 70s so vietnam was over you would have dodged that bullet right yes good good sorry sorry to interrupt. Yep, no worries um, so distraught, downtrodden, I went to high school trying to figure out, okay, there goes that plan. My dreams have been dashed. Now what do I do? And somebody convinced me to join something called the debate team. And, um, as a freshman, uh, went to the state quarterfinals in Illinois for high school debate, uh, wow. spent all four years on debate in addition to a number of different sports, uh, but really enjoyed debate. And I really very quickly realized, wow. This is a fantastic. You mean there's a profession where I can get paid for doing this? Where do I <laughs> sign up? And so nice. born was my new career aspiration. Uh, so even as a basically as a freshman in high school, I knew I wanted to go to law school. College was sort huh. of a, a speed bump, if you will, until I could get into law school. So there was no five, six or um, uh, uh, Blutowski plan for me. It was get into law school <laughs> as soon as I could. And uh, I, I wanted to be a litigator from from that point on. So uh, then it was a question of just which school. I uh, was very fortunate to go to DePaul University at College Law after the University of Illinois at Chicago. Um, and then quick story there, my best friend in law school and I, as first year law students, uh, had to take, uh, actually it was second year, because you had to take evidence first. You know, civil procedure and evidence are pretty important before you can take trial advocacy. So second year of law school, we take trial advocacy and we're both super excited about it because we both think that we want to be litigators. We want to get in a courtroom. We want to try cases. That's what we're here for. Let's go. And we both complete trial advocacy. And afterwards, I'm even more psyched about it. Like this just cements for me that this is what I want to do. I want to be a civil litigator. Completely opposite impact upon my best friend. He got out of trial and said, I never want to step foot in a courtroom ever again. I can't stand this. And he promptly pursued a very successful career in transactional healthcare. Nice. Good. Good for him. Good for him. And then um, uh, just to, to continue the, the story, graduated from uh, law school and was very fortunate to have a summer associate position at my top pick, which was Kirkland and Ellis in Chicago. Oh. Um, was then and still is preeminent litigation firm in the country. So I was over the moon, uh, started as an associate at Kirkland and Ellis and spent 12 years there, um, six of those as a partner, working on a lot of major, very complex commercial litigation. It was the best training ground one could ask for as a litigator, a fantastic experience, um, and uh, learned a great deal about complex commercial litigation. And along the way, witnessed the birth of what we now call the e-discovery industry. Uh, because I started when everything was still in boxes and folders and, and uh, we were using post-its to, to do things and there was no validation. <laughs> there, there, was, there was no, there was no um, measurement of precision and recall other than uh, who you had on your team <laughs> and the color of post-its that you used. Um, but soon the cases, there were so many documents and so many uh, materials that obviously people started to scan things. Uh, technology had improved. And we saw the very early days of what is now e-discovery and, uh, and uh, uh, databases used for document review, search, and production. Uh, I found all that very interesting. I've always been a, as I hinted at earlier, a procedure and an evidence nerd. Uh, so was quickly drawn to the technology that was starting to fuel more and more litigation strategy um, and uh, approaches. Uh, so be, took an early interest in e-discovery. After I left Kirkland, I joined uh, Kat Muchen, 
coincidentally, was where the was the same firm where my healthcare uh, transactional friend in law school was practicing. Uh, but I went there as a litigator, and while and doing this a lot of the same complex commercial litigation, but this was right around when the rules changed for the first time to use this world called electronically stored information. There we go. And um, I uh, had a conversation with leadership uh, in my firm about, you know, we really need to have a practice group or a tiger team or something to deal with electronic discovery because it's a thing and it's not a fad. It's not going to go away. It's, it's the future. And uh, some of the, um, I won't name names, but there were some folks that were a little skeptical of that thinking, ah, oh, come on, what's the big deal? Discovery is discovery. Why do we need to do anything um, until I convinced them that, uh, that uh, this really was something that needed some specialized understanding and techno technological <laughs> appreciation. And the thing that really put it over the side is when I started showing them the uh, web pages from our competitors and they were developing e-discovery practice groups, e-discovery right. task force, e-discovery tiger teams. And they said, okay, all right, fine. You've convinced us this is a thing. We, we need to do this. Um, and as a reward, you get to lead it, but don't let it interfere with everything else that you're doing. Yeah, so but, I yeah. became the... Um, uh, the head of the e discovery practice for that firm at the time and more to come, but I will pause and take a breath. Well, I, I've got a question that, that uh, it, it's um, really interesting. And, and, you know, you've been involved with Sedona, a number of, of active groups, ACEDS, EDRM. ABA, I, I, yeah. yeah, the ABA stuff, um, you know, came out with their scintillating uh, uh, <laughs> protocol on listservs today. I mean, Lift showing, serves, yes. Long yeah, over showing. Showing once again, <laughs> yeah, yeah, about 20 years overdue. Um, <laughs> showing once again, they're just on the cutting edge of technology right. implementation in the United States. Um, but something that was, I think, cutting edge was the Seventh Circuit Council on, on e-discovery. E-discovery uh, pilot program, yes. Yeah, as I recall, if that wasn't the first involving a major course, it was certainly an early one. T can you talk a little about that? How did that develop? Sure. And I'll come to that by uh, way of, um, I sort of first got involved with that. I think I was still at Cat, and it was right before I moved to Ackerman, which by then, uh, e-discovery had started to morph into information governance and into data privacy and cybersecurity. And of course, you could add AI, you could add drones, you could add all no, kinds of things. Not, to, let's not you, add AI. You could <laughs> add autonomous cars. I mean, pretty soon it becomes this long list that doesn't fit on the business card anymore. So we called it data law. Um, and so when I moved to, to Ackerman, Later on, um, I co-chaired the, the data law practice, which by now was really dealing with that Venn diagram that uh, re reflects the overlapping spheres of e-discovery, information governance, data privacy, and, and, and data security, all different, but very much related. So yeah. as part of all that, um, I was very fortunate to get invited to be part of the Seventh Circuit e-discovery pilot program which was later rebranded, but then even later um, is, is somewhat dormant today, uh, largely because um, uh, the, the view was that much had been accomplished and the materials are still there. There's some fantastic educational materials on the e-discovery yeah. pilot program uh, yeah. website. Still, you can find through the, through the Northern District of Illinois website and the Seventh Circuit's website. Um, one of the major accomplishments was, of course, coming up with the uh, protocol, uh, the e-discovery protocol that, uh, was one of the earliest ones and served as the basis for what are now far more commonly found in many different courts are standing orders and e-discovery protocols that counsel can use to get an idea of kind of where the court's head is and what the court expects with respect to e-discovery from, um, uh, from all parties uh, going forward in a case. Was that the first one that it, had been it, memorials it, like that? I, I don't, I can't say it's the first one, but certainly first was one, one I ever the, saw. Very, yeah. It's one of the various, very first ones that I was aware of. Um, yeah. And uh, it was pretty influential beyond the Seventh Circuit. Uh, but oh, that yes. protocol, that protocol still remains. And most of the judges in the Northern District of Illinois, where I practice in federal court, uh, to this day still still have it and still adhere to it. And it's still expect those who appear before them to be familiar with it and to adhere to it. Uh, so it was a great organization. I met a lot of uh, leading e-discovery professionals in the space. Uh, we eventually expanded. Initially, it was Chicago, then it expanded to the entire Seventh Circuit. Uh, yep. But then even beyond, but then eventually we expanded beyond that. Um, Judge Holderman um, was instrumental in making that successful. And I, and I got to tell you, 
Uh, a lot of the org other organizations, I know, Doug, you'll appreciate this. When it comes to thought leadership, particularly if you're trying to do it in a uh, nonpartisan, balanced consensus way like Sedona, it takes a long time. But when you have a federal judge who's basically telling you that things will be done by a certain <laughs> deadline, it gets done a lot faster. So I give yeah. a lot of credit to the judicial leadership to uh, making things happen probably faster than they otherwise would have. Uh, not that the quality suffered, don't get me wrong, but they happen a lot faster because uh, when Judge Holderman tells you you need to have your draft um, and all the uh, differences of opinion resolved by a week from, from Thursday, it gets done by a week from Thursday. Oh, yeah. I was fortunate enough to be involved in a very early one up in Seattle on the criminal side with the federal defenders and after a big case up there that, that later became the sort of the basis for the the agreement between the Department of Justice and, and, and the federal defenders and the defense bar. And if same thing, Judge Marsha Peckman was in charge of the committee. And yeah, if Judge Peckman says, we're going to meet on the first of next month and you're going to have a draft for me. Yeah, we showed up on the first with a draft. <laughs> yeah, that's, right. Yeah, nothing, nothing like a, a person with judge in front of their name telling you to get something done. Yes, the response <laughs> is yes, your honor. <laughs> yes, it, I, I understand and it will be done. Um, so that, that that's great because I always wonder about like you said it, it was influential far beyond the sphere the geographic sphere and I came across it very early on and 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 used it in some cases that I was involved in and said exactly what you just said which is hey this is something that's been judicially endorsed to tell you you know the tone you should be looking for I'm not saying copy this but if you want to get a sense of what judges are thinking you really ought to read this so Yes, yes. And and I know, and we had involvement, speaking of the Sedona Conference, particularly Working Group One, uh, we had Ken Withers from Working Group One of the Sedona Conference of uh, as, as part of the Seven Circuit E-Discovery pilot program efforts, because we wanted to make sure that we were being complimentary, not being inconsistent, but also uh, not reinventing the wheel where we didn't need to. So that was a, a great, a great relationship as well. So speaking of great organizations and what brought you to Red Grape, jumping ahead here. Sure. So after my time at uh, Ackerman, um, I then had this crazy idea that some of my former colleagues from Catton and some of my former colleagues from Ackerman would go off and start our own firm, which which we did, called Actuate Law. Uh, and uh, Actuate Law uh, was one of the founding members of that firm. I, one of the things I'd always wanted to do was, hey, let's start a law firm. Um, and so we did. Uh, and it was a huge success. Uh, the firm is uh, still doing really, really well. They've since opened up a second office in Miami. Um, we are constantly uh, referring things back and forth to one another. Great firm, great people. Uh, really love the experience and love them. Like I said, the firm was uh, was and is very successful. But um, the, the, the smaller firm platform was uh, making it a little bit difficult for me to continue to handle some of the large uh, complex matters that I yeah. had been and wanted to continue handling because quite frankly, uh, folks were, Hey, we know you and we have great respect for you and what you can do, but we're, uh, I have some questions about your bench and, and candidly, we were a small firm, so we didn't have an enormous bench and I, I was working on that, uh, but had had some conversations with Jonathan Redgrave, uh, even years before that. And frankly, if I hadn't, um, gone off and started a firm, with some of my colleagues, I, I may have joined Redgrave earlier because Redgrave, uh, the law firm, uh, has and continues to handle the most sophisticated, high-level, complex uh, litigation matters involving e-discovery, as well as tackling uh, super complex, cutting-edge, interesting information governance, data privacy, and cybersecurity issues. All of those things were things that I was doing at, uh, um, uh, at Ackerman in the data law practice. And it always respected uh, the Redgrave firm. And I had started to see people that I knew, peers in my space, join Redgrave. Going back to the Seventh Circuit E-Discovery pilot program, for example, a big part of that effort was Chris King. Um, and Chris King had joined Redgrave. And I, I started seeing more people uh, like Christine Payne and other people join Redgrave. Uh, David Shanka, I can go on. And someone's going to get mad at me for not mentioning them, so I'll stop. <laughs> um, and, and I started thinking, well, you know, I, this, I really... I, I want to be a part of this. Uh, I know what they do. Uh, they're they're always uh, leading edge on this. Uh, only band one chamber ranked for firm with respect to e-discovery. Um, I want to be a part of it. So uh, 
after my detour of starting a law firm, which was one thing I always wanted to do, uh, joined Redgrave. And, and frankly, Tom, it's been, if I say frankly one more time, someone's going to start a drinking game. Um, it, it, it's been, it's exceeding my expectations. Uh, okay. The level of depth of expertise and thought leadership within the firm, a lot of people you know are part of Sedona and have been part of Sedona, uh, is really just been fantastic. So it's been a fantastic move and a great experience. Okay. Doug, well, I've been hogging the conversation here. What do you got? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of uh, wanting to drill into your uh, Sedona experience uh, a little bit because, you know, you talked about the difference and, uh, um, you know, the WG1 group has cranked out a lot of great, uh, you know, great uh, um, uh, publications and, and what have you. So I'd be interested in a little bit about how that kind of process has worked, some of your kind of uh, – experiences working it because you you've been you were part of the wg1 group for a long time are still our chair emer emeritus right correct correct um and and so i'd be interested in how that works and also maybe some things that you know that we might be coming down the pike that uh uh you know you may they may not want to promise anything but uh just curious yeah, yeah, to yeah. See like a yeah, listserv protocol you're developing a listserv yeah, yeah. protocol <laughs> 1984 called and wants its listserv protocol back. <laughs> yeah. uh, sure. Uh, so no, no question about it. I'm a huge cheerleader for the Sedona Conference and Working Group One in particular. Um, and as you mentioned, I've been a member of both Working Group One on e-discovery and information governance and also Working Group 11 on data privacy and cybersecurity for quite some time. In fact, if I could knock on wood, I would say that uh, a paper that we've been a uh, labor of love in WG1 may finally be getting published soon. So, so stay, stay tuned on that with respect to data breach notification. But right. I digress. Um, so my first introduction to Sedona was obviously as someone who early on was very interested and involved in e-discovery. Uh, you, you couldn't be involved in e-discovery without knowing about the Sedona conference. Um, and of course, just to connect everything, Kevin Bacon style, Jonathan Redgrave was one of the people who were around when the Sedona Conference Working Group One was founded. Uh, so a lot of lot of connections there. Um, I learned of Sedona and really um, became enamored with it when I, like many people, attended a, a, T, a TSCI conference, which was educational. So it wasn't one of the working group uh, mid-year annual meetings. It was one of their educational conferences. And I was so impressed. I thought, wow, I, I've got a as they always ask, if you want to get more involved, please contact us. I said, I've got to get more involved in this. Uh, so I did, and I became a member of Working Group One, and then got involved in a variety of different papers, uh, commentary on possession, custody, and control. Um, later on, was absolutely thrilled and honored to be part of the group that was on the uh, drafting team for updating the Sedona Principles, which is the bedrock publication of sure. the Sedona Conference. Uh, the third edition uh, I was involved with and uh, was also involved in other papers, uh, became very active, was attending a lot of the meetings. And I think somebody took notice that maybe I wasn't a complete uh, knucklehead and, and contribute solidly. So right about the time when I was starting to focus a little bit more on WG11 because of privacy and security becoming a bigger part of my practice, uh, Craig Weinlein called me up and said, hey, How'd you like to be on the steering committee? Um, and so I got even more involved in working group one and served on the steering committee for several years. And then I got another phone call from Craig Weinlein, which was, hey, how would you like to be the chair of the steering committee? Uh, which I was extremely flattered and served as the chair from, uh, let's see, what was it? Uh, 2019 to 2023. So to your point, um, handed uh, the reins over to Claudia Morgan, who's fantastic. Um, she served as the, the deputy chair for a year and is now the chair of WG1. Um, uh, but the, the one nice thing about being a uh, chair is that you are uh, always a member emeritus of the steering committee. Uh, so I continue to be a member of the Working Group 1 steering committee and am really proud of our process and of the thought leadership that the group puts out. It doesn't happen overnight. And we can't always reach consensus, but that's really what makes the Sedona Conference and Working Group One's publications unique, is that they are consensus driven. So judges, in particular, feel very comfortable citing to it, uh, to the to the papers, because they are not partisan. They're not pro defense. Right. They're not pro plaintiff. They're not pro 
technologists, they're not government, they're not private industry, academic, it's all of the above. And we really do try to strike balance. And in order to strike that balance, it takes time and effort. So sometimes papers take longer than some people would like, um, but the work product would not be the same without that process. Um, so obviously you're very familiar with the Sedona publications. Uh, one thing that, that came out that was new, so if there was a, I won't call it a silver lining, maybe a copper lining or a brass lining to uh, the pandemic uh, and lockdown was that we couldn't meet. So we started uh, a new way to engage with members, which was uh, virtual town hall meetings. And in, I think it was 2020, 2021, that was our salvation, our saving grace to keep in connection with our, our membership and with other practitioners in the e-discovery space. And uh, those meetings became so wildly popular that they are now a staple, not, even though we're back to in-person meetings, they are a staple of the Sedona Working Group One offerings. And I think that's been really some fantastic programming. And we also use them as, uh, as the name implies, town halls to really talk about an issue. And the takeaway question is always, can Sedona contribute to moving the law forward in a reason and just way with respect to this topic? And those town halls have often formed the basis for a drafting team for a new, a new project. Now, I'll pause there before I get into what's the latest and greatest going on at Sedona Working Group One. All right. Um, well, one question I was what is ask the latest you, and greatest may, is going on at Sedona yeah, Group One? Which may be part of that. <laughs> but also, I was going to ask you some, about something specific because um, one of the I think one of the biggest debate areas in eDiscovery right now is the whole hyperlinked files, modern attachments discussion. So I'm curious if A, Sedona's working on something uh, related to that, and B, what are your thoughts about that whole discussion, including, I don't know if you uh, are familiar with the Uber case, maybe you've, had, maybe you've I seen am. it. Uh, I figured you probably had. So I'd be interested in your thoughts about that case as well. So, so a few things. Uh, there may be something coming out from Sedona on it, but it may be part of a larger paper. Uh, it wouldn't be a paper just on that topic because it's actually one piece of a larger issue. Uh, I will tell you that it would have been part of a commentary or a primer on ESI protocols, but then this is no secret. Uh, there was a decision reached that uh, we could not go forward with a paper on ESI protocols, which often include the discussion about uh, hyperlinks or parent-child relationships and versioning. We can go on and on um, because uh, the group couldn't reach consensus as to whether or not they should even try to reach consensus. Uh, so that that's why uh, there may still be something that comes out from Sedona on the topic that because uh, Sedona, Sedona also does non-consensus based papers. Sometimes it's just, you know, here's an educational piece. There's one thing that's been under discussion is, OK, so even if we can't do a paper on ESI protocols, can we do something that at least uh, is educational about what kind of things often come up under the umbrella of an ESI protocol so that people can at least understand what these things are, whether they should pursue them or not. And if they are either asked or are putting something forward, they know how to assess it without taking a position. So that that's can, something I, that may I, I can tell you, quick editorial comment, as somebody who works with law firms, that sort of discussion would be really welcome. Because a lot of my clients who say, I, I, I heard about this protocol thing, but I, I don't know, what, what should I have in it? What should it be? So right. just a, yeah, just a framing document, uh, educational document would be most welcome. And, and we're hearing that a lot, Tom, which is why we're trying to address it in some fashion. Um, and Doug, as you know, and have written about, uh, the, the flip side is if you agree to an ESI protocol that you don't understand, it can really come back to bite you, as we've right. seen in a number of cases. Yeah, so too bad. To your point, to your point Tom, <laughs> a little education in that space would be would be most welcome. But that's yeah. not what you asked me. You asked me about, about mm -hmm. hyperlinks, uh, which is a very, very hot topic these days. So hot that... Um, it's being litigated as we speak. Um, there are statements, declarations, positions uh, on that topic uh, that are being litigated in class actions, MDLs currently. So I think we may see some more Uber-like decisions right. um, in the future. Yeah. And, and the Uber- Which the Uber was an case, MDL. Right. Yeah, right. I mean, that's where you're seeing it and it's, it's real hot and heavy in a lot right. of different places. And interestingly enough, you know, you have the, um, you, you know, we have the early decisions about it, which uh, took the position that basically they, they, are, they are not attachments, 
as one might think of two pieces of paper stapled together. Um, then there are the cases where uh, someone agreed to something in the SI protocol they didn't understand and they were, were they were held to it, which is why having these conversations are super important. Uh, and then we have cases like Uber and uh, you know Nichols versus Noom and others that sort of say, yeah, um, we're not going to make you do this, but can you at least have some agreement where you're going to try up to some reasonable limit, which I think you're seeing more and more of that. The interesting part of part of it is that um, as the technology evolves, this becomes a evolving conversation because sure. what might have been feasible or not feasible a year ago may require a different conversation today. Um, it also is very organizationally dependent. Uh, there is no big red easy button because I've seen that argument too. It's like, oh, all you need is an E5 purview license and boom, you can do anything. Right. That is not true. And it right. depends on the organization. It depends on how they're set up. It depends on how they're figured. And, and frankly, um, I, I'm going to sound like a defense lawyer right now, but I don't think anyone courts should be requiring companies to purchase software. I'm sorry. What was that you just discovery. said? What was that you just said, Mark? <laughs> I want to pause the pause oh. button. <laughs> um, it's come out of right. the editing, right? Yeah. I, I mean, I mean, it's part of conducting discovery. Uh, I don't think anyone should be forced to go adopt new software in order to do something. Um, that that does not that that does not ring proportional to me. Yeah. Sure. No, that makes sense. Yeah, I think it's going to be interesting to see how those cases evolve. And, and since you say there are several more uh, coming down the pike, I'm, I'm eagerly looking forward to those because I think the, the case law, to me, the Uber case was the first one that really took, went, did a detailed discussion of the uh, decision and, 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 and why she kind of ruled the way she did and recognizing the technical limitations, but also recognizing some of the obligations too. So uh, right. I hope we'll get more of those. I, I think it's inevitable. I think it's inevitable yeah. because it is an issue in any major piece of litigation. It is a topic of conversation in, um, it, well, let me back up a minute. Most of those cases have ESI protocols. I don't want to say that every case needs an ESI protocol. In fact, I, I, I often advocate that many cases you shouldn't have an ESI protocol, but many of those cases tend to have ESI protocols. And the uh, modern attachment slash hyperlinks issue is almost always a topic of conversation. So I, I think it's just inevitable there's going to be more guidance on the subject post the Uber case. Yeah. So I couldn't agree uh, more. that leads me to my last area of interest here, which is. I mean, you've just described the, the, the progression that no, a lot of us who are chronologically challenged have gone through, which is, you know, post-it notes to, is it an attachment? And is a link an attachment? Um, you, you know, the progression in a very short period of time, relatively speaking, has been enormous. Yet we all say most lawyers still don't understand it. Why are we lagging in the educational component? Why isn't a Sedona conference course mandatory in every law school. Um, you know, uh, I'm just baffled by the lack of uh, understanding because of the lack of education. Um, like you said, hey, we, we have to take in law school, we have to take civil procedure, we have to take evidence. Doesn't e-discovery fall under one of those buckets? I agree with you, Tom. I think there's been progress but not enough and not fast enough. And, and I, and I think that's a, that's a general statement, but I think it's generally true. Um, the question was asked, I, don't, I can't remember how many years ago now, um, as to whether there was still a need for working group one, haven't we solved the discovery <laughs> puzzle? Isn't this you know, mission accomplished? Move yeah. on. Yeah. And, Walk and away. The, the, the yeah. resounding answer was no. <laughs> For a number of reasons. Number one, what you just identified, Tom, which is that um, uh, it, it is not part of the vernacular yet. Um, and even though there has been progress in teaching it in law schools and pockets of success, uh, it just hasn't caught on as much as you would have expected by now. In fact, I've seen efforts even in some state courts to uh, emulate, for example, the Seven Circuit Discovery Pilot Program. And there, even though there were some very, very vocal advocates uh, on the bench, it just didn't catch on. And once those advocates moved on, that was the end of it. So that's been disappointing. Uh, I think there's unfortunately a natural tendency of, of many lawyers to um, 
uh, they want to drive the car, but are really not interested in how it works or what's under the hood. And that's despite the, eth the growing ethical obligations of technical competency. Right. Good point. So the question to me is at some point, um, it, it's, at some point is, will, will the teeth of that obligation um, bite somebody such that more people have to take, have to pay more attention to it? And I'm right. not wishing ill or out, bad outcome on anybody, uh, but I don't know. I don't know what it will take. Uh, I think there is a better understanding, and particularly in more sophisticated cases, that you have to align yourself at a minimum with uh, either uh, specialty firms or uh, experts on the techno technological pieces of e-discovery and legal technology generally, so that you can comply with your ethical duty of technical competence. Uh, which candidly, I think, was already there before it had that name. Um, yeah. But um, it, 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 the other, the other thing I think is a big challenge is that it's not a law of the sea type of situation. I don't want to offend any admiralty lawyers, but it's not as though, okay, I understand the law. I can move on. The technology changes so fast. Yeah, yeah. That it's never, you're never done. And for those of right. us that really love this space, that's part of the exciting attraction is that literally while we've been talking, I guarantee you something has changed. Yeah. And we're going to have to go figure out what that is. And, and maybe what I just said a moment ago out links is now no longer correct because something has changed <laughs> or vice versa. Um, I think that's another challenge, Tom, is that it, it's, I can't, there's a sense of I can't learn it because the minute I do, there's something else I have to learn. Some of us really revel in that. Uh, and some, and I think there's just too, too many people that are, I, I this, I just can't, I can't. And I thought it. the California bar dealt with that in their ethical opinion several years ago now, where they said, look, if you don't know it yourself, hire somebody who does, whether it's retain a counsel, get somebody like the, 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 the Redgrave data group, you know, get a, get a firm that specializes this, get a consultant, but get somebody to bring the expertise to the table. If, right. if you don't do it, that's okay, but get somebody who does um, so maybe we'll see that, more of that. I don't know. Well, that's still the, as far as I know, still the the only ethical state ethical opinion on e discovery, right? So we're one one down, forty nine to go. So and Florida that's what, has <laughs> made a uh, technical CLE uh, requirement, much like yes. ethics right. uh, requirement. Yeah, um, Florida and that, Florida and North Carolina, I, I think, are still the only two states. Yeah, that have this. so it, yeah, it's just lagging. So and you're right. Maybe somebody's going to need a big hit. Somebody's going to have to take a hit to bring it across. So I don't know. Well, we're coming close to the end. Doug, anything else you wanted to ask Martin about? No, I, I think uh, I think we've covered a lot of territory. So uh, yeah. let's get to the, let's get to those uh, fun questions we do at the we end. We got some softball questions. What's a great book you've written? Uh, read and read lately, Martin. Well, what's a great book you've written lately? And, <laughs> and what's a great book you've read lately? <laughs> Um, I, I haven't, uh, I haven't written any books lately. Uh, that, that's on the bucket list for, for later, maybe when, when I, when I'm retired. Um, uh, and, I, and I've read a lot of good books. I tend to read a lot of, um, um, uh, historical nonfiction, uh, particularly okay. biographies of, of presidents. It's something I inherited from my father, but the book I'm reading right now, I'll go back and forth, uh, to, to just give you an idea more generally. And I eventually will answer the question. Um, it's either, it's either historical nonfiction or it's science fiction. Um, a big science, big science fiction fan, or um, uh, something that would be industry related. The industry related book that I'm almost done with right now is a book I picked up at a conference. I can't remember where or when or why, but it's called The Atlas of AI because you knew I had to say AI at some point in time during Ooh. this conversation. Um, Have your ears, Tom. It's it, it's, a, uh. it's a really interesting perspective on AI and a lot more. Um, it's very well researched. Um, it's eye-opening in many respects, and uh, I'll just leave it at that. I don't want to. I don't want to spoil it. No, uh, author, you recall? Oh, you you think I would? Uh, think no, I, would I, I never remember who writes the book. The title is, you know, I use the title to get it. That's all right. So I'm not going to ask you about Pete. I'm Kate sorry? Crawford is the author. It's called The Atlas right. of AI: Power, Politics, and the Planetary Costs of Artificial Intelligence by Kate Crawford. It's a really interesting uh, take. On, on the whole area. Um, was that in the science fiction category? It's not the science fiction category. Um, <laughs> okay. So since it's you're very interesting. A, yeah, no, it sounds good. I, oh, that, I, I'm going to oh, put, put it on my list here. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Absolutely. 
it, um, eye-opening in many respects. Let's put it that way. <laughs> okay. So uh, since you're such a Chicago native, I'm not going to broach the subject of pizza. That's obviously a given. Um, uh, but favorite favorite meal other than pizza? What would you what would you put down? Well, I, I got to say that uh, at the end of the day, nothing beats a good steak and martini place. And we've got quite a few outstanding ones in Chicago. Um, I'm a big fan of Gibson's and Morton's. A lot of people will say, well, come on, those are chains. I, w- but they started here. Yeah. <laughs> See, I'm allowed to yeah. go to them. Yeah. Um, and there's a particular like Ruth's place. Chris. You know, we had the first Ruth's Chris. Right. And it's still well worth going to. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, Gene and George Eddie's, of course. Uh, I and mean, there's a lot of great steak places in, in Chicago. And at the end of the day, you just can't beat that. Chicago Cuts, one of my favorites as well. Um, but uh, uh, one of the one of the best places uh, is Gibson's Italia. Uh, so it's the Gibson's restaurant, but it's Gibson's Italia. And not only is it a fantastic restaurant, but the views are spectacular, particularly in the summertime. All right. And- great. Great. How about favorite? favorite vacation spot hands down wanna, hawaii you, now hawaii hawaii really? big island small island i've what? been to all of them and we'll continue to go back uh our yeah. last trip there was uh we spent a week in Kauai. there you go one of the most delightful times uh, gail and i had was uh the aba had a i forget it was the aba or the lpm had a conference there once years ago and uh, we stayed a couple extra days and um rented motorcycles rented some harleys and drove all around the island you know once you get outside of honolulu on the other side of the mountain um it's just wonderful we're driving down pristine beaches with little food trucks stop and she'd can for a while and i'd smoke a cigar and then we drive again and driving through these monstrous uh pineapple it was wonderful it was a a wonderful day that I, i i always remember so yeah i can see that so our last question as always the, the one we, we kind of hit you with at the beginning here. Um, if you could spend a day with anybody from our profession, living or dead, uh, who would that person be and what would you do with them? What would you do for a day? Uh, what would I do for a day? I mean, other than uh, ride motorcycles around uh, Maui or Kauai, <laughs> uh, but if that yeah. wasn't their speed, maybe have lunch or dinner at uh, Gibson's Italia. There you um, go. It would be a, it would be a, 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 a dead tie between Thurgood Marshall and Sandra Day O'Connor. Um, wow. Reason being, obviously, Supreme Court justices, famous Supreme Court justices, but also being a fan of, of history, as I am, uh, both of their stories, even before they yeah. ever got to the Supreme sure. Court, are fascinating and such a such a window into our society and history that to go beyond what I've read and actually have a, a an off record conversation with, with both of them about their experiences, both before and while on the Supreme court would, would be fantastic. Oh, Thurgood, uh, you know, Thurgood's like, was like a walking history book and an incredible time in our history. I, I'm sure you've seen in, in BWI airport, which is the Thurgood Marshall airport, that display in the center uh, of the uh, concourses that they have for him it's, i mean just some of the pictures are amazing oh yeah that that that's yeah I, i'd have to go along with that one sandra day o'connor of course being a relative i i know everything about her and, and had many, <laughs> had many a lot of, of course but <laughs> yeah. i knew that yeah there you yeah. go <laughs> uh okay well great uh martin i can't thank you enough it's been a great discussion i i, I really appreciate you taking the time to uh to do this since uh uh neither of us have been much on the on the conference schedule anything coming up you go to ilta at all i i do go to ilta occasionally i'm probably not going to make it this year uh, yeah. it, it really depends on the on, on what's going on some years i make it to a lot more conferences yeah. um yeah but you know this year i missed the sedona mid-year meeting because i was in europe on business um I didn't make it to minneapolis for the wg11 meeting for the same reason Wow. Um, I'm going to be at the master's conference in Chicago, uh, next week. Cause that's easy. It's down the Good. street. Uh, Good I have been to Ilta, uh, EDI is a big conference. Obviously I was at legal week, legal tech. Uh, I love that the EDI. A, yeah. Patrick that does was a no great miss. job at that. Yep. Yeah. EDI is yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Um, uh, and, uh, 
you know, I, I've also, let's see, where, where I, was, I forgot. That's right. I was at uh, Info Next, which was the conference at Armor yeah. Runs. It used to be called MER, Managing Electronic yeah. Records. Yeah. Okay. And and uh, we'll probably be at the uh, Info Con that, that Armor Runs in Houston. October, which is going to be in Houston. Yeah. Correct. Right. Oh, yeah. well, I, I might then, pop over there. And then, of I'm course, going to Ilta uh, because it's in Nashville, so it's close. And But uh, and, Il and it's Houston. In yeah, and yeah, it's a natural, right. exactly. Uh, right. And uh, um, Houston has the same allure for me. I love Houston. Right. And then I'm, I'm not going to miss the uh, the annual meeting of the Sedona Conference uh, WG1, which will also be in October. Um, I don't think we've settled on a location yet, so stay tuned. Okay, great. Well, hopefully I'll run into you at one of them, or if I, uh, make, I, it into, it. If I make it into Chicago for a Notre Dame game this fall, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give you a shout. Uh, yeah, please do. Let me know. Yeah. I can I yep. can I can show you firsthand that uh, great view from Gibson's Italia. I that has oh. intrigued me. That's definitely been marked down on my on my bucket list here. So, great. Uh, thanks again. Really appreciate the time, Doug. Always a, always a pleasure. Of course, having you uh, having you join us and adding your insights. And uh, uh, we got a we got a case law webinar coming up soon. Uh, about uh, what well, about three weeks, I think, or oh, a little less okay. than three weeks, something like that. Uh, so, yeah, and I'll worry about it in two weeks, right? Yeah, gotta, yeah. gotta find some cases. Actually, Judge Peck's found most of our cases this month, so we're, we're in pretty good shape. So, of course, there you go. <laughs> Thanks, Martin. All right, uh, for yeah, as always, and uh, always good to see you and good to talk to you. Likewise, thank you, Doug. Good to see you, Tom. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, always a pleasure to see you as well. My, my pleasure. Thanks again. And uh, thanks Cheers. for listening in, folks. We'll uh, look forward to seeing you next time on the uh, on the Discovery Channel.